Good morning and welcome to today's Bible study starters. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 29, verses 17 through 24. We'll look at that text. I'll read it to you in just a moment, but first, let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the gifts that you have given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Especially today, we thank you as we have the opportunity to open up your word. We pray according to your promise that you would send your spirit to encourage and strengthen our faith, not only for ourselves, but so that we would be better equipped to share the good news that you have given us with the people around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, our text is Isaiah 29, verses 17 through 24. I'll read that to you now. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands, in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is good news, isn't it? Everything in this is good news. There's blessings in this text and there are curses in this text. But the curses that we see are bad things coming to an end. So, so all of these things are things that, that we have good reason to be excited about. In the next section, we'll start with, um, with the very first verse and, and something that, that we desperately want to be true, but we struggle to believe actually is. And that'll set the tone for the whole study, I think. So um, take a look at the text, Isaiah 29, 17 through 24. Maybe pause right here. And then after you've looked at at least that first verse 17, um, um, hit play again and, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. All right. All right. Well, the first verse this is exactly what we want to hear because it talks, the whole text talks about all these good things that are going to happen. And if good things are going to happen, we really want them to happen right now, don't we? We don't want to have to wait if it's not absolutely necessary. And verse 17 implies that we will not have to wait for very long. It says, is it not yet a very little while? And 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 those are the first words. That's the introduction to this promise of all these wonderful things happening. Is it not yet a very little while? Now, it was Isaiah the prophet who said this many thousands of years ago. So it kind of forces us to ask a question. Has this happened? And if it hasn't, what does God think is a little while? What does he think we think is a little while? So, that's kind of um, a burden that I'm putting on you, I guess, as, as you take a look at this text. Um, has, has this stuff that God is talking about here, that Isaiah talks about, is, is, is it happened or not? Um, so, let's start taking a look. What do you see in the text? I, what I did is I made a list, and you may want to do the same thing, because listening to me isn't going to be any better than, than reading the text. What I always find helpful when there's a long list of things that are mentioned is, is just writing out the list and then taking a little bit of time with each one of those things. I'll give you some examples, but I, I, I can't spend that much time with each one of these texts or with each one of these um, items without, uh, without this video getting longer than you're probably willing to watch. But, but what's going to happen in a very little while? 
what is God promised through his prophet Isaiah? The, the first has to do with, uh, with Lebanon. Um, again, this is um, symbolic. This is, is not something where you have to be looking for prophecy in regards to, to that particular um, place as it exists today. Um, but what it's talking about are, are places that, um, that maybe were fruitful and then became desolate and will be fruitful again. Right? And Lebanon's a symbol for that. So um, a fruitful field so fruitful that it looks like a forest. That's some pretty big fruit, isn't it? This is um, in direct contrast to what happens in Genesis chapter 3, right? Genesis chapter 3, um, Adam is told that his relationship with the earth and with the fruit that he would produce, um, the, the, the food that he would produce, that it would be a, a strenuous relationship, that it would be a fight with thorns and thistles and sweat, um, with mixed results, sort of like my garden right now that isn't much of a garden this year. And quite honestly, every time I've tried to plant a garden, it hasn't been very much of a garden. But beside the point, you don't care about my garden. The point is, this is all going to be turned around. Uh, it, fruit, the, the fields that were desolate are going to be fruitful. Okay. So, so that's number one. And this is what you can do. You can, you can develop the list, just go verse by verse or section by section, write it down and then spend a little time thinking about it. All right. So, um, the fruitful field is mentioned, the deaf are mentioned, the blind are mentioned, the meek are mentioned, which automatically, you know, I mean, again, if you read the whole text or you just listen to me talk, um, you don't stop to think about the words, but if you stop to think about the word meek, I can almost, I'm almost sure that most of you, if not all of you who are listening, automatically think of a New Testament passage, the Beatitudes, right? This is why it's good to, to make a list, to have a, a, a piece of paper nearby. So we've got fruitful fields, uh, the deaf shall hear, uh, look at what they should hear. What, uh, the, the deaf shall hear words of a book. Hmm. Okay. So they're going to they're going to hear words for the first time read from a book. Interesting. Uh, the blind shall see and and it talks about the gloom and the darkness being removed, right? Illumination. Again, very interesting. Um, kind of makes me think of John chapter 1, light coming into the darkness, Christ's incarnation, the light of the world, right? This is the value of, of making your list. Um, the meek shall obtain joy. But, but look at the description. Look at the adjective that goes with the word joy. Fresh joy. The meek are used to what happening to them. They get trampled on. They get taken advantage of. They have no power. They have no influence. Um, they never get what they want and often don't get what they need. But it says, and, and that's the, the kind of the cycle of the world. That's what we, we see happening over and over and over again, these people being taken advantage of. But this, it says, the meek shall obtain fresh joy. Something new is going to happen. Something that has never been seen before is going to happen. And then number five um, on my list is the poor, right? The poor among mankind. There's a lot of talk about Abraham and Israel and and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about how Israel is talking about God's people of faith, not just the Jewish people. But, but, um, but here in this verse, all of mankind, the whole earth is talked about, um, or at least the poor among all of mankind. What's going to happen with them? They're going to have something to be excited about. They're going to have something to exult over. What is it? The Holy One in Israel. The poor around the world are going to have something to be excited about. And that, that is not a thing. It is a person. And that person is the Holy One of Israel. Well, why would they have a reason to be excited? Why would the poor around the world have reason to be excited about this, this one in Israel? Because this one in Israel would be a blessing to the whole world. Right? Again, kind of makes me think of the Beatitudes. All right, so those are the five things that I found. You can take a look. You may find something that I miss, but there are five blessings that are described. I encourage you to make your list and spend a little time thinking about each one of those things. In the next section, I have another list. It's not quite as many. It's a list of three, but they're not blessings. They're curses. We'll take a look at that in the next section. 
I haven't done real good about telling you where we're at in terms of the verses and things. Hopefully, you've been making the lists and able to follow along. But if you're um, wondering where we're at in the text, as we start this new section, we're looking at verse 21. And and this is an interesting, an interesting verse. It's still talking about um, the the evil, and 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 listen again to what it says. It says, um, "Who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right." So, in in the previous. Um, in the previous verse, verse 20, it talks about what will happen to these people. Um, and, and then in verse 21, it's like it takes a step backward and it describes those people and, and what they're doing that's evil. And, and so I, I just want to take a look at that with you for a moment. Um, the evil of these people um, is, is what they are doing to those who are trying to um, for lack of a better way of putting it, trying to make um, the world or their nation a better place, right? <laughs> what are they doing to those people? And it mentions three things that they're doing to try to keep good things from happening. The first is, it says, by a word, they make a man out to be an offender. Well, what does that mean? This is one of the Ten Commandments, right? They're bearing false witness, they are attacking the reputations of the people who are trying to do good so that the, the, the people around them, the culture, won't recognize the people who are trying to do a good thing as good people. If they, if they believe the false witness, then the people who are trying to do good, their reputation is ruined and nobody trusts them. Does that sound familiar? Where, where evil is called good and good is called evil and reputations are destroyed, that's what's being talked about here. All right? That's one of the things that, that happens. The, the next is um, the, these evil people, they lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. Now, the gate is where a lot of business was done, where judgments were made in the city gate in a public place, right, where there were witnesses. And what it's saying is the if the if the the person who does true evil is brought to to justice, brought to the gate, the person who tries to reprove them, the person who tries to call out their sin, um, they're in trouble because the evil have already. It's almost like they've already been at the gate, and they've set a trap. They lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. The person reproving in the gate is, is the person trying to change things for the better. The problem is they're, they're being set up. They're being um, led to a trap by the people um, who, are, who are doing evil. Right? So, 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 so far, there's one more, but so far, what do we have? In the culture, we have a person, we have people who are trying to change things for the better, and their reputations are being ruined, and, and, and as they try to bring people to justice or bring justice back to the culture, um, they, they're, um, they're walking into a trap that has been set for them. And if you continue to look at that verse, the, the last part, there's a third part. The evil people turn aside the righteous. Right? How does it say it? Um, 21. And with an empty plea, turn aside him who is in the right. So they turn aside the righteous one for something that is empty and meaningless. It doesn't matter that they're looking at something that's good, not just for them, but, but it's good for the culture. And they turn aside from it. They would rather have something that's meaningless, something that's empty. Um, something that that benefits them in a temporary way, um, personally, right? So, so this is the sort of stuff that these evil people are doing. Now, remember, the ruthless shall come to nothing, the scoffer shall cease, and those looking to do evil, they're going to be cut off. That's been promised, but but this is a description of what we're used to, isn't it? And that gets to the question of the little while at the beginning of this text. Are we still waiting? Thousands of years later, 
for this to happen, for this to take place, for, for good things to happen? Because this sounds like today, doesn't it? You step out and you try to make a difference. You try to do something positive and somebody's there to try to ruin your reputation, to bear false witness against you, to, to trap you. And, 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 and people, when, when you share a good thing with them, they seem to just want to hold on to their meaningless stuff, their stuff that isn't working, their stuff that is causing problems rather than grabbing hold of the good thing that you have to offer them. That seems like um, that seems like the cycle that we're stuck in and that we're never going to get out of. It doesn't matter who's elected. It doesn't matter um, um, what happens. It doesn't matter how hard we try. It, it just seems like we're stuck in, in this cycle, doesn't it, to this very day. It doesn't seem like anything ever gets better. But I would invite you and you'll see this more in the next section, which starts with an important word. Therefore, <laughs> we'll look at that in the next section. But before we, before I turn this off and we move to the next section, I would invite you to look again at verse 21 and recognize that these three things, are th they are a perfect description of how the religious leaders treated Jesus. Remember, we're always looking for Jesus in the text. And the only way that we can see that this little while um, has come and gone and things have been made new and that we have seen this blessing is, is if we see Jesus in this text. It, it starts right here. By a word, the religious leaders made a man, Jesus, out to be an offender, right? Crucify him. They called him a criminal. They called him a blasphemer. They did this to Jesus. They bore false witness. They ruined his reputation. So even the crowds were yelling, crucify him. All to make sure that he did not bring something new into this world and that they could hold on to their meaningless stuff. They laid a snare for him. Some of them they tried and they did not work. In fact, none of them worked. It looked like one worked, finally, again, because they managed to get him onto a cross. But they laid snare one after another for him, trying to trap him. Because what did he do? He reproved them at the gate. He called out their sin. He emptied their temple. He called it a den of thieves, right? He called them whitewashed tombs. He called out their sin. They laid a trap for him as a result. And the third, it says they turned aside. They turned aside from the righteous one. And they chose to hold on to what was meaningless and empty. This description is a perfect description um, of what the religious leaders did. Um, and, and really, if, if, if you want a comparison, take a look at John chapter 1. Just the first part of John chapter 1. And this is exactly what is described, not just of the religious leaders, um, but of his own, right? He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Right? He, it light came into the darkness, into the world, but it didn't know him, right? So, so this is a description of Jesus who came to bring something new, but he was rejected. But was he overcome? In all of these attempts... Did they keep Jesus from doing what he came to do? The answer, of course, is no. And we'll talk more about that in the next and in the final section. Okay, this last section probably has a lot more in it than what I am going to um, go through with you, um, mainly because I haven't spent a whole lot of time with it. Um, but I want you, first of all, to take note of the therefore, right? <laughs> all of these promises, all of these blessings, all of the, the promises that, that, that evil is going to come to an end, um, a reminder of this, this yuck that we're stuck in, that where, where people, you know, desiring to hang on to what isn't good um, seems to keep um, any civilization, any culture, keep this world from ever getting better, Um 
we, we've gone through all that stuff, and then we have this, therefore. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who, I'm adding here, who, by the way, redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. And then he talks again. Here's what I'm going to do. But I, before we get to that, I, I want you to notice that. He says, therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham. Abraham. Great hero of faith, right? Well, yeah. The father of the, the nation of Israel. Yep, that's true. Uh, the father of all God's children, right? We sing his children, Father Abraham. I am one of them. Yes, that's true too. That's true too. But in the beginning of Abraham's life, as God's child, as God's chosen, he was a polytheist. He was an idolater. He was in unbelief. God called him out of those things and made him his chosen one, made him his child, made him the father of, of a great nation and uh, the father of our faith. Right? God did that. God called him out of those things. He called him out of darkness and into light. So, so this is an important point. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who the one who redeemed Abraham. Here's what he has to say about the house of Jacob. And oh, this is wonderful. Jacob shall no more be ashamed. No more shall his face grow pale. Right? Look at all of the children. Look at the nation. Look at the world. Look at what has happened. Look at this terrible terrible cycle of evil that seems unbreakable that we are stuck in. Take a close look. No more will you be ashamed. No more will your face grow pale. Not anymore. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands, right? Who are you? You're the work of God's hand. You're not an accident. You're not a result of... of years and years of evolution you're 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 not you're not i don't i don't care how you've been treated you're not an accident you are the work of god's hand for when jacob sees his children the work of my hands god says in his midst they will sanctify my name they will sanctify the holy one of jacob they will stand in awe of the god of israel and and i love this those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding and those who murmur, they will accept instruction. <sighs> Good news. They who have gone astray, they will come to understand. The murmurers will accept instruction. How long do we have to wait for this? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, but it would be a mistake to think that it hasn't begun. It has. Remember, Jesus overcame the ones who tried to destroy his reputation, who tried to, to who bore false witness against him, who, who laid traps for him, who, who turned aside from him and, and treated him like, like he was nothing. He overcame them. He overcame more than just them. He overcame your sin. He overcame the devil. He overcame death. And he has brought the new thing. We see evidence of it all over the Gospels. We see physically deaf people hearing. We see physically blind people seeing. We see people who have nothing being treated like royalty. Eating at the table of the Lord. We see people beyond Israel that were, were like dogs to Israel. We see them ex exalting the Holy One. Son of David, have mercy. And he does, right? We, we see evidence of all this stuff in the Gospels that something new has begun. Now, if Jesus had died and that was it, then something new was begun that, that never never was established, never never grew, never really truly changed everything. 
but he didn't stay dead. He rose, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is coming back. And through his church, by the work of his Holy Spirit, working through the word and the sacrament, all things are being made new. The process began a long time ago, the process of making all things new. And it continues. Has it been going on for a long time? Yes. Why? Because God is patient and his desire is that everyone would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This good news, the good news is that these changes have occurred and are occurring and will continue to occur, will continue to, to expand and grow out until that day of Christ's return when all things are made new. New bodies, new heaven, new earth, eternal kingdom. And the evil that was done, the scoffing, um, the ruthless plans of the devil, the opportunity to do evil, it'll all be cut off, it'll all be done away with, finally and completely. In the meantime, what we know is this, Christ has come. He has brought us something new, something that cannot be destroyed, something that will not decay, something that cannot be taken away from us. And he's given it to us in abundance, so we have the opportunity to share it with the whole wide world. I hope that you enjoy this text. There's a lot to consider and, and a lot of comfort in these wonderful words. God bless your study. God bless your week.